This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Cactus 1539 hit birds, lost thrust, and The plane shook. You could feel the whole plane shake. I wasn't supposed to be on the plane. As soon as I turned and looked out the window, I noticed the left engine was just shooting out flames. Brace, brace, brace. Heads down, stay down. My feeling was that there was no way we were going to survive. Cactus 1549, radar contact is lost. Oh, I think he said he was going to the Hudson. At that point, he kind of thought, you know, it's over. They were going to die. I happened to look in the river, and I seen this plane landing in the river. The airplane was stable. It was intact. It was floating. It feels like a miracle. Miracles give people hope. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett here at Carolina's Aviation Museum, home to U.S. Airways Flight 1549. You probably know it as the Miracle on the Hudson. Ten years ago, on January 15th, this jet carrying 155 passengers and crew left New York City for Charlotte. Within minutes, everyone's worst nightmare was happening. The complete loss of power from both engines, the jet falling from the sky. Tonight, we bring you some stories from the people on board. PBS Charlotte's Jeff Sonier and videographer Doug Stacker join us from LaGuardia Airport, where it all began. You know, for most travelers, LaGuardia is pretty much like every other busy airport. You check your bags, you check your phone, you check the weather out the window. Another gray day in New York, hopefully better weather back in Charlotte. But for the 155 passengers and crew members who boarded U.S. Airways Flight 1549 here, well, this is where their typical day at the airport turned into a life changer. Nothing extraordinary, right? It's about 60 or 70 seconds later, you hear a boom and... It was explosive sound. The plane shook. You could feel the whole plane shake. That was the moment. It was like a loud noise and heavy turbulence type of thing. Imagine an engine going clack, 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 clack. The moment these passengers on Flight 1549, New York to Charlotte, realized their last day in New York might actually be their last day anywhere. I wasn't supposed to be on the plane. I was scheduled to be on the five o'clock flight that night. But I, we got out of work early that day over in Brooklyn, so I caught the earlier flight. The safety card in your seat pocket explains the safety features of this airplane, including the location. The moment they wish they paid more attention to the safety announcement. This airplane has two exit doors It's like a, a routine, and you kind of take it for granted, I guess, um, until something really happens, you know? We're planning an hour and 13 minutes with an initial cruising altitude of 31,000 feet. The moment these strangers on a plane in seat 15A and 20C and 1D and 20A, the moment they all knew that who they were flying with might also be who they were dying with. As soon as I turned and looked out the window, I noticed the left engine, you know, was just shooting out flames. And that was the most terrified I've ever been in my life. And all I could see is water in front, and I said, this is not good. I couldn't tell by distance how close we were to the buildings. So my feeling was that there was no way we were going to survive this. You could hear people whispering to each other. You could hear people praying, saying prayers, some people praying together. As we're coming down, I had a sense of Wow, dying is not scary. It's almost like we've been preparing for it our whole lives. But it was very sad. I didn't want to go. I love my life. I literally felt like my heart had just sunk and fell on the floor. I'm like, this is it. I'm going to die. But that quickly was washed over by this sense of calmness. When I was praying, I remember that I wasn't saying, please save us because I didn't think we could be saved. I didn't see a chance of us being saved. I was just thinking to myself, please don't make this horrible for my family. But that feeling of fate, that sense of surrender, quickly turned to survival as Flight 1549 landed in one piece in the water in the Hudson. In the back of the plane, 
we could feel the tail hit. I still had my head down and I turned to look and in the aisle of the plane in the back, I could see little fountains of water shooting up through the floorboards. And that's when I knew, oh my God, we must be in the river. So I could feel how cold it was. It was just frigid cold. And that startled me, but it also told me I was still alive. I remember I was actually looking at my hands and looking at my feet, and I'm like, I'm in one piece. That's when my hope changed from like thinking I was gonna die to, wow, I think we're gonna survive this. I knew I was alive. So that's why I climbed back and got behind everybody and started making my way out behind everybody. But then all of a sudden I felt water go up my back. I'm like, this is like Titanic. This thing's going down, man. Within five seconds, the water was up to my knees already. And you're jumping out of a window and trying to get into this life raft. And there's this much frigid water in the bottom of the life raft too. So people out here on the wings were sliding off into the water. Some of the stronger men would get into the water and actually push them back up onto the wings. There were a lot of unsung heroes that day, a lot of people who went out of their way to be totally human and kind and help other people to survive. And there was a picture of me hanging out of the plane, waist deep in the water. And that's when I realized, whoa, I was one of the last passengers off this thing. And all of a sudden, my life's like, wow. I mean, I was shocked when I saw that on TV. And that's what sort of opened my eyes, like, this is a miracle. This is really a miracle. That miracle for passenger 15C, Charlotte businessman Dave Sanderson. There's not too many people who survived a plane crash. Right. Yeah. Is what brings him here, year after year, to Palisades Medical Center. Sanderson hosting charity events for the hospital, which is right on the Hudson, where emergency room staffers got glimpses of Flight 1549 as they prepared for a possible disaster. All of a sudden I'm on the fifth floor and I see the shadow go by. Hmm. It's actually a plane going down. Yes, at that point, at least we knew there were survivors. Mm -hmm. As some of those who survived 1549 arrived at the hospital, clinical coordinator Zoreta Batista remembers her patient. He was soaked and wet, soaked and shivering. He was shivering at that time. And uh, he actually could not sometimes remember what he's saying. And he was so afraid. He was so afraid and afraid and also um, uh, happy that he's actually alive. Yeah, that happy to be alive patient was Dave Sanderson. Hard to explain, but when you're going down, right, when you're going down and someone's there just to hold your hand, it means a lot. I was given the gift of a miracle of not dying that day. I was given another gift, which was to be able to see into the future and come back and live differently. Passenger 1D is Rick Elias, CEO of Red Ventures in Fort Mill, telling his story of Flight 1549 for the first time online, with almost a million viewers watching since then. And I thought about all the people I wanted to reach out that I didn't, all the fences I wanted to mend, all the experiences I wanted to have and I never did. And the fact was that everybody survived. 20C passenger Beth McHugh and 20A passenger Ben Bostic. There's so many little tiny miracles that went into making this happen. Share their stories of Flight 1549 with groups who come to see the plane in Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, like right up in one of those windows is where I was staring out at the engine on the way down. Bostic shows us his own photos of that snowy morning in New York before the flight. His business trip to Manhattan ending in a rubber raft, looking at the plane sinking tail fin with his fellow 1549 survivors, those strangers on a plane who are strangers no more. I mean, I, I remember actually being humbled to tears when I thought about how I was just, for some reason, a part of this group of like absolutely incredible individuals. I'm glad you were all here today. Thanks for coming.
Meanwhile, Beth McHugh was a regular on Flight 1549, flying home to Charlotte from sales calls in New Jersey almost every week. Now, McHugh ends every one of her talks about that miracle Flight 1549, the way the flight itself ended. Thank you so much. Thank you. With hugs you. and gratitude for people she's never met before. It's McHugh's way of sharing that miracle on the Hudson, her own miracle on the Hudson with others. Not everybody does believe in miracles, but if you were on this plane thinking you were going to die in a few minutes and you didn't, I'll appreciate it. I will say thank you. Because I'm alive, I've got a chance to do something. A second chance is part of our miracle. Thanks so much, Jeff. Here's something that will probably warm your heart. Back in 2011, one of the passengers on flight 1549 and his wife had a baby and they named their son Hudson. Hudson was born two years to the day that flight 1549 landed in the Hudson. Well, now with the plane ditched in the river, all of the members on board faced dying in the frigid conditions. Thankfully, nearby ferries and other vessels quickly responded in a race to save lives. Jeff Sonia returns with more from New York City. Yeah, we're out here on the Hudson River, taking the ferry over to Manhattan. And wow, check out that uh, skyline view. Pretty amazing, isn't it? You know, just above the skyline, you can see the planes taking off from LaGuardia, gaining altitude as they head north of the city. But uh, 10 years ago, who knew that one of those pilots flying one of those planes was looking down here at the Hudson, looking desperately for a place to land. Terrain, terrain, too low. It's the cockpit warning that Captain Sully Sullenberger recreates for this huge and hushed Charlotte audience. Pull up, pull up, until it suddenly stopped. The warning that he'll never forget, moments before the landing that we'll never forget. 2-1-0-47-18. I've heard this audio recording now many times of the air traffic control communications with our flight. I've come to have a greater appreciation of what everyone accomplished that day under very trying circumstances. And while everybody remembers how flight 1549 ended that day, Air Traffic Controller Patrick Harton remembers how it started. He took off northbound like this. This is about four miles up. This is where he hit the birds right here. Jack is 15.9, turn left heading 270. That's Harton on the radio with Sullenberger, uh, right here, guiding right Flight 1549 on his screen, climbing to just under 3,000 feet. Just another blip on the scope. Just another one of those planes over New York until this can't be happening, and that's unfortunate for everyone else involved. This flight probably would not end on a runway with the aircraft undamaged. I could feel my blood pressure and my pulse shoot up. It was so intense, I couldn't do the math on altitude and distance. It felt as if the bottom had fallen out of our world. But I wasn't thinking that he was going to wind up in the Hudson River. My, you know, I was, I'm just running down the line. Can't do LaGuardia? Okay. Yes, about Teterboro? Let's check Teterboro. Teterboro is not going to work out? Okay, what's the next airport? It's, it's newer. You know, it's funny how people are thrown together in situations like this. Harton never knew that that pilot he was talking to over the Hudson that day had more than 40 years of flying experience. And Sullenberger didn't know either that for that much younger voice at the other end, well, being an air traffic controller was sort of in his DNA. My dad did this for a living, followed in his footsteps. But nothing during Harton's previous 10 years in the tower prepared him for what he saw next on these screens. You want to try to land Wernery 1-3? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. Yep, Sullenberger was lining up the wide Hudson River, just beyond the towering George Washington Bridge, as his only place left to land passing just a hundred yards above these drivers on a bridge filled with cars, in a plane filled with passengers, losing altitude and eventually disappearing from radar. At that point, you kind of thought, you know, it's over, you know, 
that they were gonna die, basically. I mean, that's, that's what I heard. Yeah, it was crushing because in my mind, I, I, in my mind, I thought I knew what happened. You know, wingtip hits the water, does cartwheels, breaks apart. A death sentence, yes. Yeah. Thank God I was wrong. The landing was hard. When we stopped in the river, it was obvious the airplane was stable, it was intact, it was floating, and the people were probably still okay at that point. For New York Waterway, whose ferries rescued us from the frigid Hudson River. <laughs> Within three minutes, 55 seconds, the Thomas Jefferson, the first New York Waterway ferry was there. That was Captain Vince Lombardi's ferry, just pulling away from the pier as flight 1549 hit the water. We knew what we had to do and where we had to be. Lombardi was the first of the first responders, figuring out on the fly how to get close enough for a rescue nudging his moving boat nearer and nearer to the sinking plane. I had a tide pushing it down at an angle, and I'm coming into the tide, trying to hold myself at an angle. At some point in time, the tide overwhelmed me, and I had to back away so that I wouldn't, so the plane wouldn't drift into the side of the boat and hurt anybody. And Lombardi, who played himself in the movie about Miracle on the Hudson, says these movie scenes of his ferry rescue are as real as it gets. You see this? Yeah. Oh, Christ, that's a plane. Deploy that man overboard ladder right away. All right, I'm on. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Coast Guard Sector, New York, Channel 16. Thomas Jefferson. We have a passenger airliner in the North River. There were still some people who were crying and scared. Ferry's nearly intrepid, plane down. We got passengers on the wings. But uh, they, they went from scared to hopeful when they seen us pull up. And then uh, I grabbed my PA and I made an announcement on it. And I spoke very calmly, very slowly, and reassured them that there's more boats on the way. Like I said, it went from scared to hopeful. I mean, that that we knew we had the situation under control. And the other boats arrived, and people started actually getting on the boat. I knew everything was OK. And the other boats pulled up and radioed to me. I'm coming in on your port side. I'm coming past you on your starboard side. I'm heading to the port wing. I happened to look in the river, and I seen this plane landing in the river. And I seen the spray and the water. Not sure exactly what it was, except for it was a plane. By then, Vincent Lucanti and five other ferry captains were arriving at a rescue scene that nobody had ever seen before. Did you know what you would do once you got there, or was it just trying to get there and do something? Oh, we didn't know. We didn't know what we were going to see. We just arrived, and when we did arrive, the door opened and people started walking out on the wing. And once we got the first person up, everybody else seemed to climb up the net like single file. And it was almost like in school, single file, one by one, right up the ladder. I've been trying for years now to remind everyone that there are many people among us on a daily basis who have integrity and courage and compassion and do remarkable, sometimes heroic things. We just don't know who all they are. Ten years after Flight 1549, Vince Lombardi is still crossing the Hudson, but he's a long way from Manhattan now. Yeah, I like it. There's not much traffic up here. I can focus, I can do my job. But what hasn't changed is, you know, I get up every morning at 3.30 a.m. and go to work. <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, that's still the same. Lombardi's job is still ferrying passengers, passengers who don't realize how many lives he helped save that day. Passengers who don't recognize him from the headlines or from his Hollywood movie. I see Clint Eastwood like walking on my boat. <laughs> and he's just walking up the stairs and he's just looking at me. Clint Eastwood. Yeah. And he was just we were just hanging out like two old buds, you know. But on this quiet crossing outside this quiet town in New Jersey. I always think even though everything went right that day, 
I always think back, what if something went wrong? I don't know why I do that, but that, that happens with a lot of us. When someone finally came in and told me that, you know, everyone had survived, uh, I didn't believe him at first. Because That's a feeling mind. shared by Harton, who's mind. still that voice that pilots <laughs> here over the headsets, over the Hudson. I had a certain, I don't want to say swagger, but a confidence that no matter what happened in, in my profession, that I would be able to find a solution for it. No matter what happened, I would get you to a runway. That changed after the miracle on the So I kind of had to accept the fact that, you know, things are out of your control, they can be out of your control, and there's nothing you can do about that. And we defied the, the odds. That day, the plane originally scheduled to fly from LaGuardia to Charlotte didn't have these life rafts. But due to the weather, with cancellations and delays, U.S. Airways used this plane instead. Thankfully, it was equipped with life rafts. It's just another part of the miracle. The passengers and crew defied the odds. Complete loss of engine power, miraculously landing in the Hudson River, plus with quick response from rescuers, no lives were lost. With passengers and crew safe, Flight 1549 disappeared into the icy Hudson waters. The plane was recovered, and these personal items were retrieved and put on display here at Carolina's Aviation Museum. You'll see everything from eyeglasses to women's handbags. There's even a mink coat in here. Where were you on January 15th, 2009? Do you remember watching the rescue? I sure do. I was living in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, about 90 minutes outside of New York City. I'd ridden that ferry from Hoboken that was one of the first rescue vessels so many times. As I watched the rescue on TV, it seemed very personal to me, even though I didn't know anyone on the flight. Carolina Impact's Jeff Saunier and videographer Doug Stacker join us one last time from New York City where the miracle on the Hudson still inspires. Yeah, you know, 10 years ago, everybody was watching, even here in Times Square. All these screens showing all those scenes of the landing and the rescue and the heroes who saved all those passengers on flight 1549. Yeah, I can't see it. You know, there's all boats. I mean, I can see the head of it, like half the tails of it, but I can't see how big it is. They were watching from the balconies, bridges, and boat docks that overlook the Hudson River. Doesn't make any sense. They've landed in the Hudson River. The These high-rise office windows giving office workers a frightening front row seat. The clock ticking, the plane sinking. Wow! Some even capturing those moments on home video. Wow, I mean, everyone's around it. The boats are trying to keep it up. It's kind of floating by the tide down. In New York, we have a lot of people, we have a lot of emotions, personalities, but when er something happens, everybody bands together for the single purpose. Safety first, helping people, and I think 10 years down the road, people still see it the same way. It's, it's the nation coming together to help others. Yep, that's really what transformed the miracle on the Hudson over the past 10 years, from New York's story to, you know, everybody's story. It's not uncommon, in fact, it happens just about every day, for people to walk into this gallery, round the corner here, and see this towering plane above them, and have a sense of awe and reverence, and to become tearful about it. Stephen Saucier is president of the Carolinas Aviation Museum, where thousands make the pilgrimage to see the plane. Can you imagine standing on that wing out in the middle of the river? Slippery, cold. You picture the movie with the people standing on that wing. That's amazing. To hear the history of Flight 1549. The questions are, is that the real plane? Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny, even through adults, is that the real plane? To feel that miracle on the Hudson for themselves. Because most people, as they experience the plane and read the panels and watch the films and really understand this story, they start putting themselves in that position of, oh my goodness, this could have been me. To finally bring her home uh, and, you know, where she was scheduled to go. Flight 1549 passenger Ben Bostic was part of that memorable slow rolling truck caravan, finally bringing the plane back to Charlotte years later and bringing out thousands of well-wishers along the way. 
many still remembering how the miracle on the Hudson made them feel when it happened. And seeing the plane again, well, maybe giving them another chance to feel that way again. Crowds would come and they were touching it. If you watch the film, you see like these young children touching it. Oh, I touched it, I touched it, and it gives me goosebumps. People would say to me, thank you. Thank you for reminding me that we're never guaranteed tomorrow. Nothing's ever guaranteed about life. We have something in common that will never, never go away. And I, I, it's my mission to take this all over the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as those Flight 1549 passengers and crew members. Thank you. As they gather 10 years later in Charlotte with the rescuers who helped them survive. I haven't let it get to my head. And you know, I'm pretty humble about it. I still go home every day. We're struck by how normal these heroes still are and how close these strangers have become. Are you surprised that 10 years after the fact, and I know the answer to this question, that uh, you all still stay in contact? No, not at all. Get together? No, yeah. we really have become a family. And it's a celebration of life when we get together. Now they're getting together again with that same plane out of LaGuardia that they boarded 10 years ago, finally making its Charlotte destination. That same battered and beaten plane holding together on a cold day in Manhattan to keep them all alive. And the story of Miracle on the Hudson making us all feel a little more alive. The story of ordinary people like us all doing something extraordinary together. It's like these guys could be dead, you know, but here they are. What makes this story live on? Um, I, I think it's because of the feeling of good that it gives people, and mostly it's because it feels like a miracle. So many things together felt like a miracle, mm -hmm. and people love a miracle. Miracles are hopeful. Yeah. Miracles give people hope. And as we finish up here in New York, people always say, bring us back a souvenir. Well, you know, back in Charlotte, we probably already have the biggest and best souvenir of all when it comes to Miracle on the Hudson. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff and Doug. Well, Jeff, I think you're right. The ultimate souvenir of the Miracle on the Hudson is really this plane. When you're standing right here next to it, I think it's really hard not to feel chills. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this special edition of Carolina Impact. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.